Here we're going to utilize this skeletal model in order to discuss anatomical references. If we identify this bone structure here, this is in fact the sternum. If we want to describe the position of the sternum, we have to consider what we are comparing it to. And so the sternum relative to the vertebral column is going to be anterior. If we were to reference the position of the vertebral column relative to that of the sternum, we would say that the vertebral column is posterior to that of the sternum. Now using the sternum as a reference point, we can think of this as the midline. This midline, as we reference the position now of the humerus, the humerus is lateral to the sternum. The sternum also is then medial to that of the humerus. So we can see how the interaction between the point of reference or the structure of reference relative to another structure comes into now play. The top of the sternum can be also referred to as the superior aspects of the sternum. The bottom part of the sternum can also be referred to as the inferior aspects of the sternum. If you can imagine the skin, as we move towards the skin, of course that is now a reference to moving superficially. And maybe if we are referencing a structure that is deep within the thoracic cavity, we of course would then say that structure is deep relative to then the skin. So moving towards the skin, superficial, moving inside of the body would then be deep. So as we now utilize the chin to reference these two points. We know that the anterior aspect is applicable to things that are in front of another. But as we speak to the skull, we have to consider anterior is then replaced with a term called rostral. As we go backwards, we have to think of a term that is now referenced as caudal, caudal and rostral. That applies to the skull. As we move to the vertebral column, anterior and posterior is now replaced with ventral and dorsal. And if you can imagine referencing dorsal, think of a dolphin having a dorsal fin that of course is on the back side of its body. So the vertebral column has dorsal and ventral. Dorsal is the posterior aspect. Ventral is the anterior aspect. When we reference the back side of the skull, we have to say caudal. Front side of the skull, we of course then say rostral. So we'll move ourselves over here to the left arm. As we look at where the arm is connected to the rest of the body, we have to consider that this is the most proximal aspect of the arm. As we move away from the midline or away from where the body originates, we can move distally upon the humerus. So as we move towards the body, we can think proximally. As we move away from the body, we can of course then think distally. Here we need to discuss the anatomical planes. Now to best illustrate the anatomical planes, this orange piece of paper is going to be stationary and we will move the right shoulder into flexion and the right shoulder into an extension. And as this movement unfolds, we can clearly see that this movement of flexion and extension runs parallel to the sagittal plane. Now, as we rotation that is lateral, the head is turning to the left, and as we then look at cervical rotation or this lateral rotation to the right, we can see that rotation best describes movement that is parallel to the transverse plane. Now we'll focus our attention back at the right shoulder in order to observe the frontal plane. As the shoulder goes into abduction or abduction, and then as the shoulder and the humerus comes back towards the body, we go into adduction or adduction. This motion 
that is, abduction and adduction occurs parallel to this plane of motion, the frontal plane of motion. So here we will speak on bodily orientation. If we can imagine that this yellow piece of paper serves as the floor, if our kinetic chain or our body is face down or chest down onto the floor, we would call this position prone. Now, if we were to move this ground reference behind, now the kinetic chain or the body is going to be belly up or chest up or face up. This bodily position would be referred to as being supine. And so if you are lying on your back, you are supine. If you are lying on your front, you are in fact prone. So here we'll examine regions of the vertebral column. When we examine this region here, this is going to be just inferior to that of the head. The head is superior to the cervical region of the vertebral column. Now as we move inferiorly, we have to now examine this area here. This is the thoracic area of the vertebral column. Now below or inferior to the thoracic area of the vertebral column, we will have the lumbar region. Inferior to the lumbar region will be the sacral region. And then inferior to the sacral region will be the coxial region. So coxial, sacral, lumbar, thoracic, cervical, and the skull itself. So here we are examining regions of the skull. Now as we look at the eye sockets, these are going to be the orbital cavities. The orbital cavities are of course bilateral. As we move inferior to the orbital cavities, we have the nasal cavity. Inferior to the nasal cavity would of course be then the jaw. As we go ahead and open the jaw, what's inside the mouth is referencing the oral cavity. And as we move laterally upon the jaw or the mandible, this region here, the buccal region, is of course then the cheek. As we move below or inferior to that of the skull, we'll remember this bone as being the sternum. We have to move then laterally to the armpit. Now this region of the body would be referencing the axillary region of the body. Now as we move back up towards the skull, we have to think, okay, there are going to be bones of the skull, the parietal bone, the frontal bone, temporal, and then this region here, the occipital region, encompasses the area of the occipital bone. So here we'll utilize this green marker in order to reference the umbilicus or the belly button. So the region immediately around the umbilicus or the belly button will be the umbilical region. So the umbilical region is kind of an anchor point as we examine the abdominal pelvic regions of the body. Now if we use this as a reference point and we go above this region, is going to be the epigastric region. On both sides, so as we move laterally from the more medial epigastric region, and as we move laterally to the opposite side, both this region here and this region here are going to be denoted the hypochondriac regions. This is the right region or the right side of the body. This would be then the left side or the left region of the hypochondriac region of the body. So hypochondriac, epigastric, hypochondriac, again our reference point is this umbilicus region. Now as we move inferior to the umbilicus, you're going to be in the supra, meaning above pubic region. So the suprapubic region is also going to be known as the hypogastric region. Hypo meaning below or underneath that is going to be referencing the gastric region here. So if we're underneath it, it would make sense that we're above or ahead of the pelvis, but also makes sense that we are below the 
gastric or the uh, GI system. And so again, if we have the umbilicus and the umbilical region more medially, if we go underneath it, we'll be at that suprapubic or hypogastric type region. Now, lateral to this supra now, lateral to this suprapelvic region, or suprapubic region, we're going to have this left iliac region, or otherwise known as the left inguinal region. Opposite, we'll have the right in inguinal region, or the right iliac region. Now, what's interesting here is, if we just quickly review, we have now the epigastric, the left hypochondriac, the right hypochondriac, umbilicus, and then that suprapubic or epigastric region. We have the left adrenal or left iliac region, right iliac, right adrenal region. We'll have to now consider the regions that are going to be lateral to the umbilicus region. This is the left lumbar region or the left lateral flank. This is the right lateral flank or the right lateral lumbar region. So let's use again this green marker to represent the umbilicus or the belly button. Now relative to the umbilicus, we have to think there will be an upper quadrant on the right hand side of the body, an upper quadrant on the left hand side of the body. There's going to be then a lower quadrant on the lower side of the body, and then of course the lower quadrant on the right side of the body. And so clinically if someone presents say with pain and we want to then define which quadrant the pain is being experienced, we have to think relative to the umbilicus right upper quadrant, relative to the umbilicus left upper quadrant, relative to the umbilicus left lower quadrant, relative to the umbilicus right lower quadrant. And so this is often abbreviated as R-U-Q, right upper quadrant. This is often abbreviated as L-U-Q, or left upper quadrant. As we move now down below, we have to think left lower quadrant, L-L-Q, right lower quadrant, abbreviated RLQ. So here we discuss regions of the upper extremity. Now we have to first reference the axillary area, that is the armpit. If we move posterior or in back of the axillary region, we're going to have this region here is going to be the scapular region, referencing the scapula. Now as we move towards the lateral side of the body, referencing the deltoid muscle, this would be the deltoid region. So axillary, scapular, and then deltoid. Now as we reference the upper arm, that would be the brachial region. As we reference the anterior elbow, this is going to be the antecubital region. And as we move inferiorly all the way to the fingers, this area here will be referenced as the digital region. So if we reference where the lungs and the heart are, we can consider that they are within the thoracic cavity. As we move inferior in this region here, this is the abdominal cavity, and the muscle, the breathing muscle, in which separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavity is, of course, the diaphragm. And so the diaphragm will then flatten as we breathe in, and as the diaphragm relaxes, uh, it helps us to breathe out. Now, as we reference the actual pelvis, we have to now think of what regions on the pelvis are often cited. This upper region here is often cited as the ilium. Now, this more so anterior and inferior aspect is going to be referencing the pubis, and on the inferior and posterior side, this is going to be referencing the ischium. 
And so as we examine the pubic area, we will be referencing this area here. And if we have to reference the inguinal or inguinal area, you're going to be referencing this area here. So it's kind of lateral to the pubic region, and it's also going to be on the inner thigh or lateral, and then the inferior aspects of the pubic region. And so collectively, if we review, we have the thoracic cavity, we have the abdominal cavity, we're going to have different regions within the pelvis, the ilium, the pubis, and then the ischium. And then collectively, inguinal will be in this region here. So first we'll examine the calcaneal region. This is going to be on the posterior side, and of course the inferior aspects of the body. So the calcaneal region is going to be here. This is referencing this bone, the calcaneus. Now as we move up the leg, we have to think of this region as being the lower leg. Now the particular lateral aspects of this lower leg is often referred to as the surreal. This surreal region is the lateral aspects of the lower leg. Now as we move superiorly, we have to think of then the back side or the posterior aspects of the knee. This region here is referencing the popliteal region. Popliteal region, surreal, is encompassing this area of the body. Now as we move above and then we have to think below the pelvis, so inferior to the pelvis, but superior to that of the knee, often will reference this side as the femoral region. As we move superiorly, we have to consider what this region is. This region is referencing the gluteus maximus, glute minimus, and medius, of course. So we'll call this the gluteal region, and superior to the gluteal region will be then the dorsal region. Dorsal is referencing parts of the body that are above or superior to the pelvis. And of course, we have to think that the dorsal region is going to be all the way up until the cranial region of the skull.